So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm uh, thrilled to have our seminar speaker make it from Tidewater, AREC, Ames Herbert, um, somebody that served as my faculty mentor um, when I joined Virginia Tech. And uh, there were definitely some, some things through the years that um, I learned from Ames, there's, you know, without a doubt. And then, then we collaborated on I don't know how many projects. But um, you know, you're, you're probably right up there with, with one of my uh, <clears throat> most, most cited co-authors or, or, or most frequent co-authors. So definitely, I've had a lot of uh, interaction with Ames. And I was not thrilled to hear that he was retiring, that's for sure. Um, but I am thrilled that he's here to talk about his, his career. Um, Ames, Ames Herbert, David Ames Herbert, uh, got his master's degree at Auburn in the entomology department and then went for a few years there. He worked as a technician after uh, research, associate, yeah. research associate and then uh, he went on to, to actually get his PhD in the entomology department as well at, at Auburn and then um, served as a postdoc briefly and then was hired at Virginia Tech. I forget what year, sometime in the 80s, 88. Um, and he's been at the Tidewater AREC ever since, and he's had an illustrious career, very, very productive, a um, lot of awards at, at, from national commodity boards, from, from peanuts to soybeans to cotton, um, to some of the Southern, Southern Region IPM Center um, kind of career awards. He's gotten those, and two of them at the Eastern Branch Entomological Society of America. He won both the, the IPM award um, and then the extension award there. So um, there's... Heck of a lot more I could say, but Ames, I have a feeling you're going to probably say some stuff yourself. So, welcome. Thank you, Tom. So when I developed this seminar, I have a couple of a couple of things I wanted to try to do with it. One was to show folks that don't know much about applied agriculture what what the life is like, uh, what the opportunities are like, but also um, as a career choice for undergraduates and graduates, um, how can you make a career out of out of applied entomology what are your opportunities but also what are your challenges so that's kind of what i had in mind when i when i developed this um this seminar so my dad always said speak from your strengths so you're going to see some of the positives and some of the negatives but basically a sort of a rundown of 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 career so here's where the tidewater a wreck is um, in relation to where you are in Blacksburg, and you know that, that Virginia Tech has a series of these AREC's, Ag Research Extension Centers, and they're placed out there where the commodities are so that the researchers and the extension folks are on site, they're on the ground, they're in the areas where these commodities are being grown, and for our area, it's primarily cotton, peanuts, soybean, corn, wheat, and, and swine. These are the commodities, commodities that I've had responsibility for in terms of insect pest management. Cotton, you can see the acreage, 86,000. Soybeans, 600 to 700,000. Wheat, uh, 350,000. Peanut, about 14,000. So these are major commodities. You combine these and you've got some of the most valuable uh, agricultural commodities in the, in the state of Virginia. And these were my uh, commodity responsibilities. So uh, it's really easy uh, it, uh, to, to think about this in terms of how do you develop a pest management program for, uh, for these insect pests? Well, easy, but, but is it? Uh, you've, I have a research, had a research extension appointment. So the questions that you have to address, and I'll see if I can get this pointer to work, uh, pest biology. Uh, in order to develop a pest management program, you've got to understand the, the pest, you have to understand the crop injury, your response to the pest, control strategies, develop thresholds, sampling methods, and finally insecticide efficacy. The research that has to go into that then, uh, what are the outputs? Your journal publications, book chapters, your graduate students, funds, professional society presentations, etc. So this is the output from, from the work that you do to develop that program, and then with that extension appointment, delivery, publications, presentations, news articles, blogs, websites, advisories, field demos, and beyond that, evaluating the value of those programs with surveys and focus, focus groups, and then beyond that, developing the impact statements and the public value pieces. So, no big deal, right? So, some of the challenges that, that you face uh, again, uh, 
I'm down here, and this is the geophysiographic map of Virginia, and look at the, the, the commodities that I have been addressing cover about this much of the state. Look at the diversity that we're dealing with. Huge amount of diversity. Couple that with the diversity of, of climate across the state, different temperature, rainfall patterns, day lengths even. Cropping practices by the growers vary a tremendous amount as you go across the state. Cropping systems, tillage systems, farm fields and sizes, a lot of diversity there. The ecology, the vegetation, the waterways. Uh, we're out in a part of the state where we're impacting Chesapeake Bay as, as well as Albemarle. Uh, uh, native species and then invasive species. And keep in mind that all of this is continually changing. What we see now is not what we saw five years ago, and et cetera. So this is, a, this is the kind of diversity that, that, presents, that presents a challenge to developing uh, meaningful programs. So uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to give you a kind of a quick shot. We're not going to ID all these critters, but by commodity, I have dealt with every pest on this page at some time or another in the last 28 years. We've got aphids, cereal leaf beetle, we have mites, we have hymenoptera, we've got leps, we've got other mites, we've got hessian fly. All of these pests have at some point in time been a problem in Virginia, uh, economic problem in small grains. We look at uh, soybeans. Again, a huge diversity in the pests and they don't all occur in one spot, I can guarantee you. They're dotted around the state, they occur in different places at different times. Uh, but at one time or another, all of these pests have been addressed by the program and have been a, been a problem with at least some, some growers somewhere. Uh, cotton insects. Cotton came, cotton was grown in Virginia colonially up until about the 1960s. It was pushed out by the boll weevil, stayed out for several years, but had a comeback in the late 1980s, early 1990s. When I was at Tidewater, cotton came back in. So I became the cotton entomologist. And cotton is an insect magnet. Uh, cotton is, uh, has tremendous number of diversity of, of pests. Thrips are a big one. We've got corn earworm or cotton boll worm, a variety of stink bugs, plant bugs, mites, aphids, etc. So all of these pests we've addressed in some way or another. And then finally, peanuts. Peanuts are a hugely different crop than the others because the the the, the the crop is, is in the soil, it's underground. So now you're transitioning to soil, not only above ground pests, but also below, below ground pests, which adds a, a, an extra challenge to developing uh, pest management programs. So what I wanna do in the next few minutes then is talk about some of our successes. I gave some of this, a part of this seminar was requested to, to give it down at NC State uh, to their graduate students. And after presenting all these successes, one of the students says, well, what were your failures? You know, what, so I've saved one slide at the end because my response to him was, we don't have enough time for all of those. We need, a, <laughs> we need another hour to talk about the failures. There were many failures, but there were some really good successes. And what I've done is I've cherry picked a few of these success stories, one for each of those four commodities because of certain things that I want to, to, uh, to highlight. So let's start with, in general, you saw the diversity of insect pests. Farmers have a tough time ID an insect pest. One of the first things that we did was develop this flip guide. This thing became so popular that we printed it three times and it was distributed probably about 25,000 copies, not only across the US, uh, Virginia, but it was picked up across much of the US. Insect ID is critical, and with all the Google and all the instant stuff, Growers like it in their pocket. They want it spit-proof, sun-proof, and they want it on the, the dash of the truck. So let's talk about our, our, one of our success stories in wheat. This is cereal leaf beetle. Cereal leaf beetle is a common pest throughout much of the world uh, and much of the uh, U.S. It's a wheat pest primarily. The adults overwinter. They emerge in <coughs> late uh, March. Uh, uh, and begin laying eggs. They're very easy to see. They're these orange eggs laid on the tops close to the mid veins of the, of the upper leaves of the, of the wheat plants. Those eggs hatch into larvae and those larvae uh, feed on the leaf tissue. And by the way, um, with this seminar, I'm not gonna show you much research data. 
I'm going to show you the highlights and the outputs, but I'm also going to show you uh, evidence of the research in terms of, of publications, and I'll, and I'll uh, show you those for each of these commodities. And you just have to trust me that when you publish in upper journals, and most of these are, you've got to have good science, you have to have good experimental design, good statistics, a good story, a unique uh, uh, something to add to the literature, and good writing skills. So trust me when I say that what you're seeing here is kind of the, the, the output but a lot of research went into these, and we don't have time to talk about a lot of the research. So this is what these um, cereal leaf beetle larvae can do. They strip these upper leaves, which are critical in, in, in uh, the photosynthesis that's necessary to fill the, 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 uh, the grain heads. These are what some of the fields looked like back in the days when we were getting a lot of pressure. The damaged fields are so stripped that they're bleached, you've got 50 to 60 percent yield loss in some of these fields versus undamaged protected areas which are green. So you have a potential of a very serious problem. Um, and one of the other things that I want to mention here, it's a good place to mention it, uh, one of the strongest assets to uh, an applied program anywhere you put it is your network. I worked really hard to establish good communication network with our county agents because they're on they're they're on the front line, and I say that because this whole five-year project that that resulted in in a two-state effort, uh, five-state effort to develop this this new threshold, was a result of a phone call from a county agent, uh, Keith Balderson. Many of you know him. Keith said that the current thresholds are not working. We've got to have better. It's crazy up here. People are, are overspraying fields. They're wasting pesticide. We've got to have a new threshold. That one phone call generated this, this project. And after a five-year project with a PhD student collaborating with NC State, <laughs> we released what I think is one of the cleanest and best economic thresholds that, that we've ever seen across the country, but primarily because this is a very clean insect pest in that it only has one host crop, which is wheat. It has no alternative host, has a single generation. It emerges, lays eggs, the larvae feed, they develop into adults, those adults go back into uh, estivation and overwintering. So this threshold, after many field trials over the state, uh, sampling a, a minimum number of tillers, threshold of 25 eggs and small larvae in 100 tillers. At least 50% need to be small larvae, and this was really important. By the time you saw some hatchlings, it meant that all the eggs were laid. The, you were never, if you didn't see a threshold at 50%, you were never going to see a threshold. It meant that the, 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 the generation had committed. And also the nice thing about this is you could make an application when the larvae were small so you didn't have to tolerate any damage to the crop. This thing was rapidly adopted um, across not only Virginia and North Carolina, but all the way down through South Carolina into Alabama where they were having this problem. This was really easy to scout for, these eggs and larvae. It was really easy to apply, and it was rapidly uh, adopted. This is the uh, spin out, 25 egg. We, we spent a lot of time on it. This is the brochure that we developed for it. Uh, hundreds of these were, were handed out and it outlines very clearly how to do it and what the thresholds, what the thresholds are. These are the uh, refereed articles. You don't need to read all of these, but I just want to give you a list of them. We spun out a lot of articles and every name that's in red was a graduate student that either was the major lead or some had some role. So this involved a lot of graduate student work and a lot of good journal articles came out of this out of this work in addition to the extension pub. So let's talk about soybeans. Soybeans are the largest row crop in acreage in, in Virginia, 600 to 700,000 acres statewide, spread over about 64 to 60 to 70 counties, depending on the year. Corn earworm is a primary pest. This is a pest that we call a primary pest because it eats the seed. It's not a secondary pest or an indirect pest eating leaves. It's, it, it goes directly to the, the soybean uh, seed and can devastate a crop in a matter of, of uh, a few, a generation, which is about a 14 day fe feeding period. They really like to go to into the seed, uh, into the pods 
and eat the seed, eat the seed as, as, they're, as they're developing. We understand after a lot of work, we understand the biology very well, uh, that one of the key crops for corn earworm is corn. This is the common name, is based on uh, the feeding in the tips of, of corn. So they feed in field corn, and when after the larvae feed, they drop to the soil and pupate in the corn fields. When those, when those uh, adults emerge, they fly into cotton, soybean, tomato, peppers, uh, many ornamentals, they attack a lot of stuff, but this corn is their nursery every season because they feed in this. So we developed a, a, an intense process of, of monitoring these adults as they fly from corn. But what we realized was that the relationship of the percent infestation in corn had a strong relationship with what happened consequently in, in soybeans. This is soybean acres treated and percent corn ears infested based on a state survey. These were uh, mounted for many years, uh, started before I came to Virginia, um, and we carried it through about 2012. This survey was about 7,500 ears pulled out of about 60 to 70 counties across the state. And what we were able to do with this, with this uh, ear survey was to give growers an idea of the percent infested corn was going to put them at what level of risk uh, later in the season when the soybean crop became susceptible. So this was conditioning information. It didn't tell them that the crop was going to be infested, but it said this is a low risk year, this is a high risk year. And this regression turned out to be really good. Some of the oddballs that we found, uh, we, we sort of could understand those after we studied this for a while. Even though we might predict high, uh, based on what we saw in corn, we could have devastating rains that would drown the pupae in the soil that would reduce that, that pressure. But by and large, it was a very good, um, very good predictor of the level of risk that these guys were going to be uh, uh, tending to face. And this is a good time to point out, we started putting that out as an advisory, and this thing gradually was improved to the point where uh, all of our pest management inf information now is posted on a blog. And this is a recent uh, blog delivery. And uh, it also goes out to about 550 email recipients across the mid-Atlantic and even some uh, further out. This is a weekly advisory that we, that we give out on all the insect pests, uh, all the surveys, and actually some of the uh, other faculty put in weed information, disease information, and this thing has gotten to be very hot. We get calls from all over the country about what, what this advisory is, is saying. So it's another way to get information out um, to, to the growers. Back to corn earworm, we did not develop the thresholds for corn earworm and soybeans. Those were completed about a year before I came on board down at NC State. But what we did was we took this threshold and we put it into an electronic uh, uh, a computer accessible calculator. And uh, this was done way back when uh, a fellow named Nick Stone was here in the department uh, at, at, at Tech. This is the only threshold that I know of that's truly an economic threshold. It's got economics in it. This is a, a screenshot. A grower puts in his control cost and puts in the estimated price per bushel, and this ec economic threshold changes as it should. So here's his scratch pad, but it, let's say the price of uh, control costs go up. We've used this as a training tool at meetings. So let's say you're uh, 750, but now you have to go by air because you've had a, a, a lot of water, and that's going to be more like 12 bucks an acre. What does that do to your threshold? This is the only calculator I know of where you actually plug in that information and you get an instant uh, threshold based on your, your number per row foot in this case, you're looking at one per row foot under this, under this scenario. This thing is, is still out there and, and is still used. Another thing that we've been doing is looking at pesticide resistance, uh, insecticide resistance with corn earworm. Uh, this is a pyrethroid resistance. Pyrethroid insecticides have been the keystone for soybean insect pest management for probably 30 years. And Everything was going pretty well until we started seeing some evidence of possible uh, resistance development. So we got involved with uh, Mississippi State uh, 
started a program that we, that we uh, began collaborating with where they were sending out pre-treated vials. These are pre-treated vials that are, that are received by all the entomologists that want to be involved all the way from, from Mississippi to Virginia, pre-treated with a known amount of a, of a pyrethroid. We catch the moths live, put them into these vials, put, close the lids, open them in 24 hours. If the moth flies out, it's no longer susceptible. So we test thousands of these vials annually, and these are the results. Up until about 2007, we weren't seeing any survivorship much at all. We were looking at less than 5% survivorship, and boom, in 2008, we jumped up, and we've been climbing ever since. We had a low year here, not sure what happened, but 2016, 40% of all the moths that we test are living. This has been a huge change. So what have we done in response to this? We show the growers this every year, and this has resulted in pretty massive field failures now when they go out with these cheap pyrethroids. So we've been trying to move them to non-pyrethroids that are not only more effective on this, but have a very low toxicity to pollinators. Some have zero toxicity to pollinators, so it's a win-win. This is a better way to control your worms but you're also uh, doing something that's environmentally more friendly. The only problem is the, the newer insecticides are more expensive. So they try to hang on to these pyrethroids, but when we start showing them this kind of information, we've, begin, we've, we've been able to drag them into using and considering and buying these, these other more effective, but also uh, uh, products that are, that are easier on, on, on the pollinator uh, community and natural enemies. Stink bugs are a huge problem in soybeans. These are the common species. Um, these have been around for uh, since I, before I was a graduate student. Uh, they've been around a long time. These are native in the U.S. The green stink bug, the adult and nymph, the brown stink bug, adult and nymph. These have been around for a long time. Stink bugs go directly to the seed, just the way corn earworm. They don't eat the seed, but they puncture to pull out the fluids. They cause the shriveling, if they uh, cause this deformity. If they hit the seeds early enough, they cause these flat pods. They can be devastating. Um, and one of the students that we graduated not long ago, well, it's been a while now, um, David Owens, he's now a PhD student down at Florida State. He did his work on reevaluating our thresholds using cage studies. We worked about three years. The old thresholds, um, had been around since before I came to Virginia Tech. They needed to be redone. And the previous thresholds, uh, the new work showed that we were able to increase, or increase those thresholds almost twofold in the case of, of sweet netting. And in other words, uh, the crop, since the early work had been done in general, is less, uh, is more tolerant of, of the feeding. So we were able to increase these thresholds. That's huge. That means that these guys can allow more in the fields before they have to pull the trigger. Now here's a question. Why do we have two thresholds for grain and seed? Um, and I'll, I'll ask Louie. He's fixing to have his defense or, 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 or Ben. First of all, what, what is seed? Seed is uh, more valuable because the grower is going to have that seed processed and sell it for next year's crop. There's your clue. Um, we did the research on grain. We did the research on the grain and, and we, we had to swag the thresholds for seed. Seed is generally about twice as valuable than, than grain, so we just cut the thresholds in half. We call this a swag, a scientific wild ass guess. You can't, <laughs> you can't do research on every possibility, so you have to kind of swag it. If this is twice as valuable, then you can allow half as many uh, caterpillars in the fields. This has been really popular. Um, these new thresholds have been stable now for about three years and we were able to introduce those. And again, the, the important thing really was that we were able to raise these thresholds which has turned out to, to save a lot of, of treatments uh, for growers fields. And then a new guy moved into the, 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 uh, the turf, this brown marmorated stink bug. I say new relative to the native species. It, it, it's, been a, it's, a, it's a new pest. Uh, you've probably had seminars on it, and, you, and they're probably in your house or your garage. 
once we began to see all these different stink bugs, we released another guide. This is a field guide to stink bug ID. Uh, we released it as a mid-Atlantic. It was picked up by the IPM centers. They asked us to do a second version that's a national version. So this new version has stink bugs um, uh, throughout the, the whole U.S. and including the species out in the southwest and California and so forth. But, stink, but the ID is, is important. The other thing that we do is we monitor every year uh, the soybean fields throughout the state for stink bugs, for, especially for brown marmorated and, this, and kudzu bug, which is a new pest. This is just a snapshot of what we've done in 2016. This is a, a survey that we have folks do in their cars. They're going out and checking fields, and they're running about 20 to 22,000 miles per summer combined. In the course of this survey, we're checking fields. Oops. Jumping way ahead. Checking fields throughout the counties and putting out weekly advisories of, of what they're finding. Uh, one thing that's that's kind of unusual, we've seen it the last two years. This this bug, we're talking about low numbers. This is the number in 15 sweeps, one to four, five to twelve, a high being greater than 13. The populations, although we see them expanding in their range the numbers are going down. We have no high infestations in 2016. Uh, in some years we've had extreme high levels, but the past couple summers they've been dropping down. Point being, this is weekly information that's going out to growers and it's giving them a heads up on, on what's in their, their counties. There are a lot of hosts. Uh, Tom Kuhar and his lab have done a tremendous amount of work and others uh, in the mid-Atlantic with, with brown marmorated, so I'm not gonna dwell on this a whole lot. But to say that one of the primary, one of the primary alternate hosts that we see is this tree of heaven. This is a rampant weed in Virginia, um, more so than in in uh, in the Piedmont area, and we also see it a lot. It's a it's a field edge weed or a, a sunny. It likes it likes medians and and the outer edges of of, of woods, and and brown marmorates love this love tree of heaven. It was a host crop back in Asia before they, they migrate or invaded the U.S. This is a slide from Orange County, Virginia, and this was a Armageddon of brown marmorated stink bugs. They were developing in this tree of heaven bordering the soybean field and dropping into this field. You can see our, our, our flags there where we had our plots. And along these field edges, they were, they were devastating the, the soybeans on the edges by going after those seeds. This is some data that came out of, of Tom and, and, and Ben Agner and, and my programs where we were looking at this, this edge effect. This insect, even, in, even to some extent in nursery, I mean in uh, orchards, has an edge effect, but in soybeans it's a really strong edge effect. In other words, it moves into field edges and very rarely moves out from the edges. And this is just an example of the kind of data. These are numbers. This is the the uh, field, this is the woods, this is the field edge, the trees on the edge of the field, this is a 50 foot into the soybean field, and this is in the middle of the soybean field. So what you're seeing here is essentially nothing past about 50 feet from the edge. And this is a single example, but this has been found hundreds of times in, in our states, in Delaware, uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia, where we see this. This edge effect is so consistent that we were able to capitalize on this. This is a shot of field edges that have been damaged by brown marmorated stink bugs, and uh, the edges are green, and the rest of the fields have senesced uh, in the normal uh, maturation time. This is called stay green. These plants are staying green because they were damaged and they're trying to catch up. So this presents a real bad problem for the grower. He's ready to harvest this, but he can't drive into this, and so what they mainly have had to do is abandon these edges. It's not worth bringing the harvest equipment back. So this is a total loss on these green edges, but it's also a, a really good teaching point. When they see this, uh, we say, next year, you better monitor your edges because you can clean this up. And in fact, we were able to show that you could only had to treat the field edges. And this got picked up. This is an example of some of the records that we took, we have about four or five years data on this. This is 
uh, individual fields in these counties, uh, the date that, that the treatment went out, this is an edge treatment only, one tractor boom around the edge of the field. So they're treating anywhere from 20 to 30% or so of the field, depending on the field size. What we did then is after that uh, treatment went out, we went back post-treatment and did surveys and found zero, 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 zero bucks. The, the one field edge treatment at the right time took care of the problem. So not only are they uh, reducing the total amount, their, re their, their immediate re reaction was, we're, we're spraying all our fields and we're going to spray 100%. No, you don't have to spray 100%. You can spray field edges and get by with it. This has been very powerful and it was picked up very quickly. We didn't have to break any bad habits with this one. They weren't already doing something. So we were able to hand them a, a management tool that was sort of ahead of the game and it was adopted not only by the growers, but by the uh, pesticide companies that do a lot of the treatments. Uh, they grabbed it and, and uh, it was very effective. Now another problem with sampling brown marmorated stink bugs is they have a very strong, what we call startle response, more so than the natives. They, they, uh, they, they sense the slightest vibration and they drop to the ground. So it's hard to get in there with standard uh, sampling techniques. Um, they're so startled that if you go up with a camera and try to take a picture of one, they'll fall on the ground. They're, they're very sensitive. So one of the things that we talked about, was we saw some evidence that this might work in, in fruit. Um, can we do a visual sampling so that we don't have to do a, uh, don't have to disturb the, the canopy with this standard sweep net system? So one of the projects was to compare our, our sweep net process, our standard sample, to a two-minute visual. And this is one of the um, this is one of the best regressions I've ever seen in my 28 years as a faculty member in Virginia. This is this is Ben Agner's work. When we saw this, it's like bingo. What this says is that the sweet net counts and the visual counts are interchangeable. The two-minute visual is interchangeable with the sweet net sampling. Now, what's so powerful about this, and I had to light the fire under Ben. Ben, this is golden, man. This is golden. Because what this means is, as our growers are getting older and fewer, they don't want to carry a sweet net. If we can get them to just walk into only the edges and do this visual count, a, a scout uh, consultant can, can sample between two and three times more fields in a day than he could with a sweet net. He can nail it and get back in the truck and call it in and treat as needed. This has been huge. It's been adopted. We still get calls. In fact, I've got an interview uh, scheduled uh, Thursday with folks out in states where brown marmorated is now moving into their beans. Brown marmorated has moved into Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and they're calling us uh, about, about, about some of this work. All of this information that we've talked about, the edge treatment, the two-minute visual, and many other things were put together. This was a three-year project that was in collaboration with um, Delaware, Maryland, funded by United Soybean Board, and they, they produced this publication that has all of these results in it. Um, and, I, and I complimented Ben. He's one of the few grad students that had his data published nationally before he was graduated in, in, a, in an extension pub by, by USB. So that's um, many publications related to this, and many students had a role. And Ben, we've got your most recent one here at, at the top. And this was David Owen's work with the, with the thresholds and so forth. Many other projects that we don't have time to, to discuss. So let's talk about peanuts. Um, peanuts are a completely different crop in, in, in because they grow underground and they have both above ground and, and soil pests. So this is uh, southern corn rootworm was our, was our challenge. And southern corn rootworm, it, the adult is a cucumber beetle. The immature is called southern corn rootworm. This is protected. This is uh, damaged. And, and protected uh, peanut pods. So how does this work? The female cucumber beetle, who doesn't do a lot of feeding actually in the peanuts, but she's attracted to this 
uh, soil under the peanuts because the soil is moist and shady. She lays her eggs in the top of the soil. The larvae hatch and they go to these pods and they feed when the pods are developing. They, they like these tender pods so they not only uh, reduce yield, but then they also damage and puncture and cause uh, secondary organisms to move in. It's a real mess. They're even somewhat tied to aflatoxin under dry conditions. Now the problem with southern coral rootworm, because it's a soil pest, there's no good scouting system that, that would work for this. You can't do sweep nets. You, you have to dig up pods and you have to sift soil and no grower would, would tolerate it. So we had a challenge. How do we develop a pest management program for a soil pest? This took a lot of work, and most of this was in conjunction with Rick Brandenburg at NC State. Rick and I worked with our students for several years, and we finally, these are, uh, we, we sifted tons of soil to, 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 get, uh, a, to, to get a better understanding of the relationship of numbers of, of rootworm and the kind of damage they were doing so that we could try to get, a, 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 get at this uh, threshold. We finally gave it up and went with a completely different approach. This is a postdoc that came into my program and, and ran this for about three years. And we also at this point had to bring in agronomy. We had to learn a lot about soil because what we learned with our, with our um, greenhouse studies was that southern corn rootworm eggs and larvae need about 100% soil moisture to survive. They have to have a high level of soil moisture. Now, a lot of the soils in the coastal plain are sandy, well-drained, and they don't hold moisture very long. And what we learned is those are very poor habitats for this pest versus soils that are, uh, uh, have, have a higher, oops, sorry, have a higher uh, loam content. So we classified the soils in the peanut areas for Virginia and North Carolina in terms of their loam content, and we developed a risk index that a grower could use based on these soil characteristics and some other information. The higher the score, the higher the risk. So loamy sand, very low risk. As you increase that loam content, you increase the risk. Drainage is also a factor. Well-drained, low risk. Poorly drained, high risk. Field history of damage. If you've ever had damage, it means the conditions are probably right in that field. You may have it again. And then planting date, we learned that the early planted peanuts could grow beyond a, 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 a susceptibility period uh, if, if, they, if they were planted earlier, so there's a, a risk. And some cultivar resistance was built in. A grower then could take his field, his or her field, put it into their index, get a total score, and, and, it would, and we would rank it as low, medium, or, or moderate risk. Rick and I did over 400 fields in, in three years in the two states to, to ground truth this, this, this risk index. And what the results showed was it's about 90% effective. And that, that other 10% was if a guy brought in an irrigation rig and started irrigating that sandy soil, he would increase the risk. So there's a 10%, but I, t I told Rick, we agreed, I'll, go no I'll take a 90%. Uh, I'll, if I could put my money in something that would give me 90%, I'll do it. So we were able to um, convince many growers. When we started this, 100% of the peanut acreage in our states was being treated for this rootworm. Being treated with 13 pounds of a granular insecticide called chlorpyrifos. 100%, and it goes out as a granule. There were bird kills, there were, there were uh, some fish kills, there was handling, you had to dump the grains, you had to clean the hoppers, a lot of exposure. When we released this thing, within about two years, we had dropped the, the uh, acreage treated to about 30%. We eliminated a lot of the fields because they were sandy fields and they just weren't under risk. This is a really good, uh, we released this in a lot of different ways, worked with growers, and we still work with a few. This was last summer. This is a grower up in Surrey County and, and really good grower. Um, and he had mapped his fields and by the way, all the fields are in the soil surveys that the growers can go to. They can go to these field surveys and get those drainage class, those textures. Once that's recorded for a field, that never changes. So we were able to work with this guy, and these are the plots uh, that, that we uh, put in into these different soil types. And he was classified uh, with these soil types. We won't go into the detail. 
But when we ran the index, and this is, by the way, also on the web, you plug in your, your information and it spit out your, your risk level. And for him, it spit out a risk level of 50, which is very low risk. So what we do, and we did this with all these other growers in years past, we put out treatments. We put out the chlorpyrifos. We put out the belay, a new uh, neonicotinoid that, that, that looks like it has, whoop, keep hitting the wrong button there. And we put out some combinations of insecticides, and we compared the peanut yields with the untreated, and bingo. The, the advisory was right. There was no significant difference between the treatments and the untreated. The advisory said low risk, you don't need to treat. And we proved it to, to Stephen Pittman that he didn't need to treat. And we did this so many times that, that people were convinced and, and adopted it in a, in a large way. We, were, we felt good about this because another, another thing that we, that we saw, when Lohr's band was going down on 100% of the acreage, we were having massive spider mite outbreaks in our peanuts because Lohr's band was killing these natural enemies. So once we pulled them off of that, we almost never find spider mite infestations anymore in our, in our peanuts. Many, many publications. And finally, cotton. Cotton is a, a very, very interesting crop to work with. It's an insect magnet. Uh, and if, if you've been around at all, you, you know about the, the uh, problems over the years with things like boll weevil and boll worm and tarnished plant bug. Millions of dollars uh, of damage. A lot of the same pests. The, the uh, stink bugs are a real problem in cotton, the green and the brown. They go for the seed, just like they do in soybean. They're going for the seed. They're going for the uh, most nutritious part of the bowl. So they probe these bowls with their proboscis, and they go in and try to feed on the seed. When they probe the bowl, that wart on the inside of the bowl wall is the, is the bowl wall's response to the toxin. So that's an in, indicates that the, that the stink bug uh, perforated that, that bowl wall. If they find that seed, uh, what does the seed produce in a cotton bowl? The lint. So if they feed on that seed, you get, you get ruined lint. And, and the response is, uh, this, is a healthy, this is a healthy bowl. This bowl has been damaged by stink bugs. So it's a, a lint quality factor and a lint uh, yield factor. They can, be, they can be very devastating. So the cotton growers in the southeast came to Cotton Incorporated and said, we need new thresholds. We need new sampling uh, plans. We're frustrated. Uh, we, need, we need help. And they put out a grant, and we formed a working group, Southeast Row Crop Entomology Working Group, that is Virginia to Alabama, because we all have the same problems. And Cotton Incorporated funded this three-year project for us to develop these new thresholds. We all took different bites of the elephant. We couldn't all do all the same work, but we all took different parts and we put this thing together in a collaborative, collaborative way. This is the group. Uh, it's changed a little over time, um, but that was basically the group. And this is the output. Uh, again, I'll show you some of the pubs, but this is the output. This is one of the things, uh, one of the older entomologists, even older than me, believe it or not, down in Alabama said that in his career, he said this was the best project he'd ever been involved in because we nailed this. This is the, this is the output. What you're seeing is the two sides of, of this card. And what you have on this card is some picks for the growers. This is what the, you know, in other words, this is, this is what you need to be looking for on the insides of these bowl walls. The current thresholds were based on internal damage. Uh, stink bug damage. Uh, you have to pop the bowls and you have to look at what percent have this internal damage. And they were requiring about 100 bowls per field to be popped. That was kind of the current thing. And there was a static threshold. 20% infested bowls or damaged bowls, you've got a problem. Well, the consultant said, we don't, we don't have time to pop 100 bowls. How low can we go? How, how few can, can we actually sample? So we've got pictures. That's the wart. Um, they said, can we not even pop the bowls? Can we look at the relationship between these external punctures and internal damage? So all we have to do is count these external punctures. After a lot of work with, with a postdoc that's now with Monsanto, the answer to that was no. There was not a good enough relationship with external to internal. 
you would see puncture marks with no damage and you'd see no damage on the outside and having bad lint. It wasn't a good enough relationship. We had to, we had to stay with popping the bowls. But what we did uh, learn is that you can pop far fewer than, than 100. So what you've got here then is the, 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 uh, the pictures on the other side of the, of the card. You've got the, the, uh, the, the, the recommended procedure. Pull a random sample of quarter-sized bowls, and I'll go back to that in a minute. Um, 25 bowls. We did 100, we did 200, we did 75, we did 50, we did 25, and 25 gave us the same answer as 100 or 150. We worked it down until we got the least number of bowls you could pull. So rather than having to pull 100, you only have to pull 25 if they're randomly selected. And sort the bowls into those that you think are damaged by looking at the external punctures. There's a higher likelihood that those are damaged on the inside. Pop those first. If you hit your threshold, you don't even have to pop all 25. So it's a real time saver. So what are these holes about? What the research showed is that this is the bowl diameter that stink bugs prefer to feed on. There's a certain time when cotton bowls are susceptible. When they're smaller than this, they don't have enough seed to be attractive. When they're larger than this, the seed gets too tough and the bowl wall gets too tough. This is the cohort that is susceptible, and that's why these, these holes are not a random uh, drill a hole in the card deal. This took a whole separate project. This was another student's project. And what we recommend is going out weekly because when you sample with this card, the cohort that you're sampling today was not even in the field last week because the bowls have grown past the ones you sampled last week or on the outside of, of, the, of the margin. So you are always sampling fresh damage, which is important because if you're sampling old damage, you may be treating a field where the bugs have fed and gone. If you're sampling fresh damage and you hit the threshold, then you're, then you're in business. The other new thing about this was we, uh, we realized that a, a static 20% bowl damage was not reasonable because the plant doesn't stay equally susceptible. So this is a dynamic threshold that changes with week of bloom. As cotton, as cotton matures, it flowers from the bottom up and from the inside out, and it forms its bowls from the bottom up and from the inside out, and there's always a different percent of bowls that are susceptible, and it changes over time. So the threshold goes from 50%, the most sensitive time, back to 10%, and then back up as the bowls toughen up. So this is a a dynamic threshold. It's very easy to do. You walk out, use your card, put these in your nail pouch, pop them. If you're there, you're there. And this has been so well received that this is the third printing of the cards. And the guys in the Mid-South even picked these up and they're now changing it to fit the Mid-South cotton. So this was a very, very effective um, program. There's a fly in the ointment. And that's brown marmorate. What we learned through our field cage studies in Virginia is that brown marmorated stink bug likes bowls that are bigger than this, actually has a preference for bowls that are bigger than that, and it does massive damage. Now, uh, the good news for us in Virginia, brown marmorateds have tended to be more Piedmont pests. Our cotton is not in the Piedmont. It's in the coastal plain. We don't have many brown marmorateds in the coastal plain by comparison. But North Carolina has Piedmont cotton. They've had fields hammered. Alabama's got fields in Piedmont. They've had some fields hammered in Georgia. So this is going to be, uh, it's, it, it means there's room for more work, guys and gals. Uh, the story's not over. We had something that was pat, and now brown marmorateds have come in and, and, and uh, Giving us a curveball. These are the pubs. So, I'm almost done. What were your failures? Growers don't always listen and they don't always adopt. That's the bottom line. And if you pay attention and find out why they didn't adapt or adopt, it's probably you did something stupid. You created something that takes too much time, costs too much money, and it's got to be cheap, it's got to be fast, or they're not going to adopt it. So when we failed, oftentimes it was back to the drawing board. But we failed a lot. 
because even though we sometimes we go in with a little too much research, a little too much arrogance, and then finally I, I, I tell my students or told them, remember the 33% rule. I feel good if 33% of what I put out works. If 33% of the trials that I put out, remember all the variability that we're dealing with, and you're trying to come up with one answer? If 33% of the things like, like Ben's regression, that's a home run. That's in that 33%. But many times, uh, the, if you get 33% that, that you can make sense of, that give you consistent results, and then there's 33% that, that show you the trends, not quite as tight, but the trends are there, and there's 33% that are just junk. The grower oversprayed it. The, the tornado took your cages and moved them to the next county. We've had all that happen. Flooded, droughts, you're going to lose 33% of your field work no matter what. So, Tom, those are my comments. I hope they were somewhat helpful. And, oh yeah, I do have one more slide. So this was an actual event. One of my students, Kathy Kaminga, was studying green stink bugs and she actually found some orange ones. This is not, these are not gimped up. There's actually a, a, a color morph that will, that will occur. They're pretty rare, but that's a green stink bug. Is Mark Chorba still in the room? Mark, we just couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> so we, we made him into a little, <laughs> we just couldn't help it. Thank you, Ames. Dini. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about doing agricultural <coughs> field work. So how much time do you spend? Like when do you start? What month? And then how much time are you actually out there in the field trying to get all this data and get all this set up? Depends on the crop. You know, we plant our cotton and peanuts in, in May. Soybeans can be planted from May through July. Wheat's planted in November. So when you've got a wheat and a... a a winter crop like wheat planted in November, October, and harvested in July, you're, you know, there's, there's never a time when you're not in the field, ever. Do Does that help? Data analysis, I guess. Well, that's, uh, that's all. you fit all that in. Yeah. Certainly. You got a team. You know, it's not me doing all this. We have a team, a big team. We have different skills and. And we've done a lot of collaboration with, with Tom and Carlisle and others. Uh, collaboration was huge for me. A lot of collaboration with Galen Dively in Maryland, Joanne Whalen, uh, many across you see it. We didn't try to do it all. Collaboration was key. But it's, uh, it's a good question. There were times when we needed to be two people for sure. But Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm looking at your, the trend for the pyrethroid resistance, um, and you're saying that the farmers and the, the applicators aren't adopting some of the newer things because it's more expensive. Um, what What's the end? Like, how do you get that to go back down if, if you're not going to adopt something that's more expensive? Like, what what is, I mean, how would you approach it? I don't know. Um, how do you bring resistance back down? Yeah, uh, and especially with trying to convince them to do something that's more expensive than right. not. Well, we're not going to bring resistance down because we think that part of this could actually be due to where the genetics are coming from. We may be getting uh, resistance from, from Puerto Rico or the Caribbean. We don't know. So we're not going to bring that down. We don't spray soybeans that often. We don't, we're not causing the problem, I don't think. I think it's being, I think it's, it's being caused somewhere else. That's my gut level. So we can't bring that resistance down, but what we can do is continue to um, convince them that it's, if you spray that pyrethroid and you don't get control and you spray it again and you spray it again, by the time you've done all that, you might as well have bought the good stuff. But what we've done is tried to do trials. So we say, you don't need that many ounces. This is the least amount you need if you do it at the right time. And the pollinator thing has gotten to be huge as you know. 
And this is a real selling point for us because the growers want to be in compliance with all this. So we can say, look, another benefit is you can get these out without damaging your pollinators. So they're coming. And the industries, some of the, some of the newer products are now going generic, so the prices are starting to come down a little bit. And there are more choices. The industry sort of saw this coming. So there, there are more um, non-pyrethroid options. Um, EPA just took the best one we had away. Could not believe it. It had the cleanest uh, record for natural enemies. I had, had a student, I didn't even talk about her work. Um, she compared that, that product that was removed with some other products. It had zero impact on natural enemies. Zero. Pardon? What was the product? Flubendiamide. And they took it for, for another reason for benthic organism uh, a model that they had, but it really cut the legs out from under us because we were saying, guys, this one has a perfect, almost a perfect um, profile. It doesn't affect any of the natural enemies, and we, we showed that. We had the data. Um, so, but there are, other, there are others in that uh, diamine class that are available, and, and there, are other, there are other endoxicarb, and there, there's some others. Um, but it, it's a slow, when, when, when growers um, are so used to these inexpensive pyrethroids, it's hard to break that cycle, but this, it, we're breaking it. We and pollinator protection and so forth and so forth. But it's amazing to us, too, that these companies will slap it, they'll put two pyrethroids and slap a new name on it and say, this will work. It's like, what? But anyway, it, it we're you know it it's coming around. Yes. Have you seen any uh, changes, either positive or negative, that you might attribute to a climate change in your part of the world? You know, it's it's tough. I think the invasives that we're seeing are the, are they climate change? Um, we have new pests. We have this new sugarcane aphid. Uh, that's ra rapidly moved from Texas all the way up into Virginia. Um, was kudzu bug released? You know, we have questions. We can't prove these. But then there are things that we don't see anymore. Uh, we think that the, the Clean Air Act has um, removed so much of the ozone that it's, it's been a positive influence on spider mites. And the reason I say that is there were studies that showed that high ozone levels exacerbated spider mite it, it, it uh, increased fecundity and reduced generation time. And, w and if you looked at Virginia several years ago before the Clean Air Act, we were in an ozone hotspot for our peanuts. That's gone. So climate change, um, that's hard to pin down. We're seeing a whole lot more drought in, in central Virginia. Now it's almost an annual event. There are pockets of Virginia that have been uh, hammered by drought uh, and, and is that climate change? This is not a political statement here. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Ames. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to say that, uh, some of the grad students that, that are here, they're about to embark on some careers and maybe getting a job very similar to the one that you held for for all those years and, and uh, I mean you're a, you're a success story and the one thing that I've learned from you and that hopefully maybe some of these students when you get these kind of jobs is you could really see what, what drove his research I mean he was doing what mattered to the groups that he was working for there's nothing more core to a land-grant university than that and and not only can you do that, I mean, you're you're making a difference, but you can have a successful career too in all facets. So I think you just showed it right here. Anyway. Yeah, and, and there's always money. <laughs> there's always money because the growers will fund it, the grower organizations will fund it if you're on the right project. And and there's just so much. There's biology, there's ecology. No matter what, how you want to approach it, there's toxicology. There, there's, there, it's just, and, and if we don't have people doing it, we're going to be in trouble. If we don't keep scientists, young scientists, working with ag pests, we're going to be in trouble eventually. It's changing really fast. And I didn't even touch on GMOs. Um, it, it's, it's such a, such, it's changing so fast 
and the growers are at their mercy. If we don't have land grant and extension, Bobby's left. Um, if we don't have extension, land grant, dedicated young scientists that step into these, these roles and, and work for the grower, uh, we're, we're going to be in trouble as a nation, in my opinion, for food and fiber. We got to keep them on the on the cutting edge. We we took a little bite out of what we did there in Virginia, but it's you could echo this in every state, no matter the commodity. Hey, Kurt. Hey, and I'd just like to add something to what Tom said. Uh, a few years ago, we were working out a, a little grant that was funded my career for ten years or so. And, uh, Elizabeth and I were on the phone with Ann. We said, uh, "We think it's pretty good," and there was silence at the other end. First time I've ever heard that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Yep.